Yeah, no, it's really shit. Moving yep. on. Yep. Um, <laughs> seriously, I we're not going to linger on the thing because it's miserable and none of us feel like being miserable. I am always looking for an excuse to get us to video games as quickly as I can on an episode of Podquisition. And I feel like if there was ever a week where me going, hey, this is a video game podcast, we talk about video games, and someone would jump in and talk Thank about a video game Christ. straight away, this might be the week. Who's got a video game they want to talk about? I want to get there in under 60 seconds. We do have an alarm <laughs> on the wall that says, in case of presidency, break glass. So, video games. <laughs> I did I that Dragon on the one Age. minute mark. Fuck yes. I'm going to I'm gonna fucking jump in. Do it. I've been playing Dragon Age this week, but I'm biased as hell. You've been playing it as well, Steph. How are you getting on with it? I mean, I'm biased as hell. <laughs> All things considered. <laughs> um, considering uh, well... one of my oldest and, and dearest friends is... Uh, is biased as hell. Um, <laughs> Dragon Age, Dragon Age: The Vile Guard, pretty good. I have issues. Yeah. I have a lot of little niggling um, annoyances with it. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. Want to kick off by saying that despite what the internet claims, because the internet is conveniently forgetting how Bioware's writing sounds and is. <laughs> I just want to point out that the conversation, because I've gotten that far. Um, I mean, well, I've gotten as far as boinking Tash, but um, <laughs> yeah. I have gotten to the initial discussion about um, Tash's uh, t- being non-binary and my character's uh, ability to relate to that. And I just want to say, in a game, in a game where you can pick up an in-game document that is the baddies, the the Venatori, um, one of them complaining about leaving the door open, which is cute, but then (laughs) one of your companions pointing out how clever and funny Bioware is, by saying out loud, "Oh, it's so strange that the the bad guys talk about mundane things," um, as well as a <laughs> what Phoenix called as a a, a twist. A- as soon as I started playing, they saw that a mile away, and we're far from that twist being revealed. And I'm looking at it thinking, "This ain't fucking subtle." Like they they've gone too hard because they want you to replay it and think, "Oh, that's clever." I know what you're thinking about. I've had this conversation with other people who have not seen it at all, and I don't know if I'd have seen it if Fee hadn't pointed it out, but Fee having pointed it out, it is so fucking obvious now. I mean, I will say that the fact they pointed it out within 30 seconds has coloured my my um, opinion. Fee pointed out, like, three people that that thing could relate to, and... I stopped and thought and went, ah, oh, fuck, it is right about one of them. <laughs> they are really good at that, by the way. Mm. These ability to call shit is infuriating because <laughs> The Thing is one of my favourite films, possibly mm-hmm. over the years becoming my favourite horror film of all time and certainly the crowned king of body horror. Within a minute... Dogs the monster. For fuck's sake. <laughs> you were saying in a game with writing like the Venatori thing. Yes, sorry. In a game where at one point the companions might as well have just out loud said, we can't continue on this quest until all of our side stories are done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The dialogue where you relate to Tash as a trans and or non-binary person is some of the most naturalistic in the game. And... Laura, as someone who was consulting on the cultural side of things, I'm proud of you for being involved in what I <laughs> what I suspect. I mean, what the internet has what assumed. The internet has, well, I mean, that's it. <laughs> like, if nothing else, I'm proud as fuck of you for being the game's lead writer. Because yeah, yeah. <laughs> that certainly seems to be what the internet thinks. The internet has assumed I did everything on this game from casting the voice actors <laughs> for every character to... Bioware needing my sign off on stuff to uh like th- there's a lot of weird things I've been alleged to but I'm glad people are enjoying certain bits of this game yeah. wink wink nudge nudge people are imbeciles <laughs> 
not the people that are enjoying it. Um, the people <laughs> that are blaming you for things that no consultant has ever had the power to do. And a little bit of insight into this industry rather than being an outraged tourist who has no fucking business in this community would, would be able to ascertain. But I think it does speak to their inherent belief that simply existing as a trans mm -hmm. person is cringeworthy, has coloured their opinion of that. Well, they're, they're falsified, jumped up performative views on that. Because, no, I've said statements almost verbatim to describe um, like my first coming out and stuff. It is very, I don't know, it sounds lived. It sounds lived, which is unlike so much like someone else pointed it out as well like the people who are trying to make a deal out of this and say oh it's bad writing really are conveniently putting aside or if they ever knew at all the fake gamers how awkward a lot of bioware's writing is as evidenced by the fact that i've unlocked the um the romance option for taj and that i am cringing into my clothes as I do with all of the flirting in that game. Awkward as fuck. Bioware are good at characters. They are good at um, plot devices, I think. Uh, they have some really good little storytelling details. But when it comes to the connective tissue, which can be difficult, it took me a long time to get around the issue that writing isn't just about the moments it, it isn't even all like just about the characters you need stuff to do with them um they're great at making a villain uh the villains of this are sublime what's the tentacly one what's the one that looks like dr octopus took it too far oh uh Gillenane. yeah Gillenane. <laughs> i just got to the I'll, I'll call it the 300 moment with her oh yeah 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 animated exquisitely the sheer reaction of her and the timing of it is beautiful and i love mm -hmm. the visual concept of her like just the the horrible limp tentacles draped over her own headdress and all of that but anyway i'm digressing um <laughs> they are great at those bits but when mm. it comes to um, a lot of the dialogue between them, they've never been all that great. And the queer stuff, you can tell they were careful as fuck. You can tell the experience went into that. The consideration went into that. I will say this on the queer stuff. I've been someone who has been vocally critical of Bioware in the past for queer stuff, particularly trans representation. That's no secret. I've I've you know, I've talked publicly about my thoughts on particularly, you know, Dragon Age Inquisition for its time was incredibly progressive for what games were doing. It for was sure. a huge step forward. Undeniably it was a watershed moment, but you can look back at it and go, you did still decide to cast a cis woman in that role. Oh, and I think yeah. like the bigger complaint I have about Krem in that game is that Krem is closely associated with one of your companions in that game, Iron Bull, and Iron Bull is like Krem's ride or die, like, ally of the year, will defend him down to the death. But if you are transphobic about Krem to Iron Bull, it won't so much as give you a Iron Bull disapproves of that, and it won't stop Iron Bull from romancing you, and that oh. feels really weird. Oh, Like, you can still romance Iron Bull after being cr transphobic about Krem to his face. Like... You know, problems there. You look at stuff like Mass Effect Andromeda, which has now been patched, but we've talked about before the fact that famously oh. that game had a character who you talk to her and the first conversation you have is, Hi, I'm trans. I'm moving away from the Milky Way because I don't want anyone to know I'm trans anymore or know my dead name. Anyway, I'm trans. Here's my yeah. dead name. Completely unasked for. What I will say about, about Veilgard is I am glad that I have yet to reach anything in this game where I've gone, this is going to be that thing that if I were in the usual cycle of how I cover games, I would need to go, I, I think that's uh, oh, that's that's a thing we, we need to talk about for the future. I am really glad that EA allowed as many things through the production pipeline as they did on trans content in this game. Yeah. And I'm glad that, that the experience that is here 
is not one that didn't happen because of executive vetoing. Yeah. I'm glad that this got to be what it is. And I I had doubts because I've seen trans rep before and I've seen it go wrong and I I don't well, I think I've just demonstrated I don't rate Bioware as top tier writing. So I was prepared to cringe. And practically the first line of Tashi's is nobody tells me what to be. Yeah. I went Oh, how thick are they going to lay this on? I'm not going to deny that is a little heavy of a of an initial yeah. approach, but, but it does get nice. It does get really nicely called back to in that conversation you talk about between a trans rook and Tash. There is that moment of look. I'm not going to tell you what what you're experiencing, Tash, but like one of the first things you said in my presence was this. I think I know what's going on with you. Yeah, like my I was on edge a bit, but it has been pleasantly surprising and that scene you bring up there leads me neatly to what i find so refreshing about this it has not been tash's responsibility to tell you who they are you are helping them figure it out which usually you brought it up with andromeda perfectly i am trans here is my dead name like all of that shit like it can be a bit of a thorny issue to demonstrate a character's transness to an audience in a way that isn't ham-fisted. I could speak to experience on that, having mm. written not one but two things where that is uh, something I wanted to get across. Yeah. But the fact that it's not their responsibility to tell you up front and they found a nice way to discuss that, explore that without pulling an Andromeda. Yeah. Game controls like shit. I will <laughs> say that about Dragon Age the Veil Guard. That's not the experience I've had, but I'm curious to hear now. So it's not just Bioware that does this, but I have a criticism of a certain type of big budget game, what I call over animation, where they spend so long giving characters flourishes or making them move like as quote unquote realistically as possible that it can get in the way and make things less responsive than it should be. And I've really gotten annoyed with the jump button and the pick stuff up button being the same. I do agree with that. I do wish there was an option to auto pick up by just walking over. I would jump accidentally a lot less. (laughs) I've had issues with the fact you can't nudge a character. Like you can't, there's no precision movement because they will like do a little lungy step unless you are like so careful. I did have a problem in like the opening hours of the game with how easy it was to fall off ledges because there's some bits that are straight up platforming and this game ain't built for that. And like I say, they can very easily lunge themselves off. Like it's not like mm. you get a penalty for it. Um, yeah, so, but it, it's so it's a minor annoyance. And there's some stuff that reminds me of Stellar Blade, where they've done the um, auto parkour when you're sprinting, which I do like when they've made sure to not apply it to guardrails <laughs> over ledges. Uh-huh. I was going to say when it's not applied to, I'm trying to pick something up off the table and I accidentally vault over the that table. as well. <laughs> yes. Like, just... <laughs> It's My, minor, it's not a big thing, but occasionally I will yeah. just jump over a table I'm trying to interact with. And yeah, so it feels like a certain type of game that I find, it's not like it's uncontrollable. It's it's just slightly unwieldy, which over the course of it is is a real pain in the ass. And I had that feeling with combat as well, which I've played enough now to mentally adjust to it. So I'm doing a lot better. But the early goings where it's like, they've just, they add enough flourish to your every attack that until you get used to that, it feels unresponsive. Where it's like, you didn't have to sweep your attack just that little bit extra. I've not found that so much. My, My experience has mainly been that I have appreciated how many of my attack animations I can cancel with a dodge. Meaning that if I am doing a big thing and like an incoming attack is going, I don't feel like I'm committed to it, that I can get out the way 
before like I can just abruptly cut that big an- uh, that an- animation off before it finishes. It doesn't apply to everything. And like I say, mm. having gotten used to it, um, I'm getting on with it a lot more because mm. it's more about just getting into the rhythm of it. I did not like this combat system at all at first. I do really quite like it now. Again, I have some issues. I went with a rogue. It's not just the fact that the controls are a bit wonky when it comes to aiming the bow for precision attacks. This is not a game built for methodically trying to pop off headshots. Because in the time you've spent doing that, you could be doing damage. Yeah. I'm glad I found armor that ups my hip fire right. So now I'm just like popping them off like a little walk-in machine gun. And that that might be part of the difference, is I've been playing a mage, and the mage has really not been built around trying to be precise. Yeah. Um, or at least the build I've done has been big area of effect lightning chain damage. So what I do is I just run into the like the middle of a group of people, set off this big circular area where like I don't have to even aim at enemies. Enemies within the big circle just take big lightning strikes that stun them. I back the fuck off and just work as like a little management person telling my people what to go attack, yeah. flinging my spells from a distance, and then I run back in purely if my lightning's done enough uh, stagger that I can mm. come in and get a fancy animated uh, finisher. Well, that... That does speak to another long-running Bioware problem, where the quality of your experience can be based on their classes. I played Dragon Age Origins as a Blood Mage. Anyone mm. who's like familiar with the series is <laughs> wincing right now. Mm-hmm. But I will say, now that I've gotten like used to it, and I've more or less given up popping off headshots, just because it's a waste of time, uh, unless I'm in a particular situation where using, I've unlocked a skill that lets me deal a, a, an explosion of necrosis damage if I hold it down long enough, and sometimes that's worth it. But anyway, point is, I have unlocked the saboteur specific uh, specialization for the rogue, and mm. now the game is awesome because I can throw down a turret. By the way. Anyone who loved Bioware games for the Bioware-ness of it all, you ain't going to be pleased. I Well, I say this, I understand people disappointed with this, but my character can pull out a mortar cannon, and when they're done firing it, like firing a dozen shells, they can fling the mortar cannon like a frisbee, <laughs> and it will explode in the target's face. That is not old school Dragon Age. It is not Dragon Age at all, but I really like it. As someone that loves anime bullshit, I've been loving my mage who's running around with, like, my, my specialization uh, has reached a point where electric attacks do fire damage and fire attacks do electric damage, and I'm setting off big walls of, expl- of lightning and fire everywhere, and then I jump backwards, and I fire out a crow made of lightning that explodes yeah. into a shower of little electrical storms. And that is the most... It feels so fucking powerful to do that. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. mm. it is. It is very much my vibe of combat. Yeah, like, it's a lot closer to mine than... Like, I will... I'll play a bio like if we're talking about old older Bioware games, like I'll play mm. one. I'm not in it for the combat. Like the original one, I when you play a mage and you just sort of set the default attack and you and it's just watching you thrust forward a little bit with your stick. Like compared to what I'm compared to yeah. a mortar cannon. I'm I, I, I know it's not gonna be everyone's take, but like I played I've played most of the past Dragon Ages, I'd say even Inquisition, in spite of their combat more than because of it. Yeah. And it's nice to have one where the combat for its own sake has been has gotten to the point where it is feeling I'm I'm looking forward to fights. Yeah. I I'll say as well, like it's by the way, Fee's been just shaking their head at me. Um <laughs> they've yeah. not we've both been talking to Fee. Laura yeah. they're not impressed. They're not impressed. They have been... They do this a lot. They get a lot of enjoyment out of watching me play games. And by that, I mean they get a lot of enjoyment out of slagging off the games while I'm playing them. (laughs) He's been getting their mileage out of this. 
Oh, see, I get the opposite experience, which is I, I, I've just been excitedly talking about things I did and being like, <laughs> I, I did that, it's good, isn't it? I've not, I've not been hearing any of the negatives. I've just been like, yeah, I'm good at stuff. Well, I, I think, <laughs> I think our individual relationships have always had a different atmosphere. <laughs> They've always had a different <laughs> atmosphere. Um, so yeah, like I will say, the combat speaks to the other part of this game that really strikes me. The whole tone is different. In in terms of of this game's wacky. A lot of it is just visual and stuff. But I've got a crow's head. You do. I'm wearing a crow's head and I've got a bow <laughs> that is an octopus. Like not a live one, but it's like carved. It looks fucking incredible. I want a replica of it. I- it's not taking itself overly seriously, and I'm having gr- a great yeah, time like, with that. The visual style is so ostentatious that it's borderline cartoonish. And as someone who has found the Dragon Age series enjoyable enough, maybe I'm not the person Bioware should have been appealing to. That will be an opinion. But this <laughs> appeals to me more than any, certainly any Dragon Age game has from that studio. Mm. I do have again lots of little complaints where I'm that's what's holding me back from saying it's great to keep in it mm. as yeah, it's pretty good. Uh things like the amount of times I have like a, a an objective has been light a bunch of candles, dickhead, or turn a bunch of statues, dickhead. I'm very <laughs> bored of that now. And there are other sort of lots of little... De- like, the, the the way merchants work feels like such a holdover from when the game was a live service. Hmm. The idea of buying what in another game is vendor junk from vendors to sell to other gen- uh, uh, vendors... Not genders, sorry, this is <laughs> me being woke again. Uh, to other vendors, it's it really annoys me. It annoys me that I can like go to a shop in this game and I look at it and I'm like, it's just a bunch of stuff to ferry to the other shop to buy armor and cosmetics that have no preview. So I don't know if I they do actually wish they had a better good. preview. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like a JPEG of a helmet isn't going to tell me if the helmet looks fucking goofy, yeah. says Steph, who's wasted a lot of money on goofy helmets, but does not regret the crow helmet, I need to point <laughs> out. But there is, you know, there's good, there's bad. I won't get into all of it, because a lot of it is just, like, nitty-gritty stuff. But the aesthetic, it's very fun. Some of this stuff looks like it should be in Breath of the Wild, like it should be in a Zelda. I've got this death mask, and... Uh, an accompanying suit. It looks like the Happy Mask Salesman by way of HR Giga. And I'm all right with that. Also, Emmerich's yeah. lovely. Oh, Emmerich's the best. Yeah. I've I've just, in no spoiler terms, I've just gotten to the bit of Emmerich explaining, like, what his plan for the future is. Mm. And... I think that's super interesting. Um, like vague g- general overview talk of Emmerich as a character. He's he's a man who looks like a like a seventy year old party magician, who is a necromancer with a childhood fear of death. Yeah, who looks after all the little ghosties and the skeletons because he'd he'd want to be treated nicely by someone if he was dead. So we should do that now. And yeah. I'm like, that. you're lovely, you're very sweet. The more time has gone on. He, he is, outside of Tash, he is my favourite character. Yes. He's, my, he's my next favourite character. I love Same. the two of them both very much. Um, Fee, uh, like, that's the one aspect of the game Phoenix has enjoyed. They love Emmerich. And they noticed a lot of, like, autistic traits in him. And Yeah. yeah. I don't think that's an accident. No, um, I can see it. Yeah. Um. But yeah. To, to to quick quickly talk about some of my very biased thoughts about the game. Sure. I'm fucking loving it, yeah. and I know I'm biased. I played for the first four days that that game was out. 
I was playing till 2, 2.30 in the morning every day. I, have done um, that. I I only haven't been playing more of it because I had a stupid work obligation I agreed to like a month ago that I that got moved to be Dragon Age release day. I had to start doing a thing. So I've had to spend like two days fucking doing work that didn't Dragon Age. But I have just been binging it all day for like the first four days and I I resent that I'm not hmm. That I can't be playing it today. I actively resent that, and that is a good sign. Things that I think this has done really, really well. Having recently replayed Dragon Age Inquisition, Veilguard fixes a lot of the problems that I think Inquisition had that sort of held it back from being an easier recommendation. Namely, Inquisition throws you way too quickly into a huge open area full of a lot of Busy work you don't really need to worry about, but not enough information to understand what work in that big open area you should or shouldn't be doing. It is a bit of a joke amongst Bioware players that people pick up Inquisition and never escape the Hinterlands. And this, you know, for for better or worse, starts a lot more linearly, getting you, like, what is the big bad? What is my motivation? Mm. Who are these characters? Getting enough plot hooks there that when... They slowly start to spread things out. They don't just suddenly plonk a hundred quest objectives onto the map all at once yeah. in an overwhelming thing where you feel like you can't walk away from an area and you don't know really what you're fighting for yet. The pacing is so snapping. I'm a big, right. I've talked on this podcast and in reviews so much about pacing and how important mm. I find it. Stuff moves at a good clip, doesn't it? Yeah. It and like I think they've done a much better job of like introduce the villain real quick and like mm. give you a mission that goes this is what they are capable of you should be aware of what's coming i think they do a good job of uh again issues with inquisition inquisition waits way too long to start letting you do your party bonding because i think that's the best content in inquisition is when you start doing quests where like your party members open up to you and you start to get to know them yeah which doesn't really happen until like 15 20 hours in when you get to skyhold in inquisition Wild. i'm glad that this takes a very different approach on that i have felt that the side quests compared to inquisition have felt much more like actual stories worth worth investigating of interest like on the whole very few side quests feel like I'm going and picking up 10 MacGuffins for no reason so someone can say thank you and I won't have a sense that, like, it was useful to the community that I'm in. They all feel at least tangentially related to, oh, this is building up the tone of the thing that this area's um, companion character is invested in. On that note, I do really like that whenever you pick up a new companion you do their little introductory quest and it ends with a like a, a little quasi animated cutscene oh that yeah sort of tells hints at what's to coming and each one introduces the slightest hint of like what the antagonist of it is and it sets up so well like it makes me yeah. anticipate pretty much every single one of their quest lines every every story mission ends with a little well, you achieved this, but little did they know, this was coming. Mm -hmm. Ooh. And, like, just enough of it to be like, oh, oh, yeah, that's it. That's intrigue. I want more yeah, of that. That's the shit they're that's, good at. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. The, w one of the biggest improvements this has made on Inquisition is it has felt like there has been so little wasted space. There, there are a lot of choices that are made that I have looked at and gone, that's a really nice touch that saves my time from being wasted. Things like when I'm back at the, the lighthouse and I'm trying to see which of my companions have new little bits of dialogue for me to go see, I can just scan around and see which ones have a light lit above their doorway and it's spinning around. That tells me if I go to that room, there's a chat to have. I, have to, I don't have to do the thing that you do in Mass Effect on the Normandy where you run to every single person, start dialogue, see that it's the same dialogue you've already seen, wait until you have the option to back out. It's yes. like, nah. I, I stand in the lighthouse, scan around, look out, stand outside, scan around. Cool, I know who I can talk to. Fucking love that shit. I love that when, if you've set a quest with a marker uh, and you go to the Alluvian in the lighthouse, it will give you the option to just fast travel straight to the place where that quest is happening rather than um, having to walk through the, the, the land to get, get to the doorway. 
there's little bits like that where I've gone, you've made it really easy for me to just keep being where the content is happening and not have that moment of this is a good moment to put it down. And I've I've appreciated that. Yeah, there's a lot that I'm really digging about this. As someone that, like, absolutely loves Bioware's games, n- not someone that, you know, do- doesn't see flaws in stuff they've had in the past, but, like, a Bioware game coming out is a huge moment for me kind of person. Mm-hmm. It's been a while since there's been one that I've that I have felt good about. <laughs> like That's great. Andromeda and Anthem were both weird in their own ways. It's nice to have one that I'm playing and going, this is capturing the thing I really like about Bioware, and I'm having a good time. I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear it. For my part, largely positive. I've got a lot of little details that's kept me as like not a huge fan, but Possibly the most likable Bioware game I've played. Uh, yeah. For a game that started its life and from all accounts spent several mm. years in development as a live service game and then pivoted to a single player game, I am surprised at how minimal the leftover DNA yeah. of that change is. Oh, in that like, light, it, it's impressive as heck. It is impressive that it has come out as like a return to form and not oh this is a thing that you can see with something else and you can feel it at all moments yeah it it is impressive they have pulled the thing off of a game that long in development yeah pretty much yeah anyway hey conrad you've been playing anything this week uh well so i listen we all know uh yesterday was a very very difficult day for me personally because you know, everything going on, I fired up Satisfactory, and there'd been an update, and the mods I installed completely, like, fucked the, uh, the installation, and it, and it was crashing, and I, I appreciate how thoughtful everyone has been in expressing, you know, their disappointment and sadness at this turn of events, but I I do want to let you know, uh, the mods got updated, and I'm back in, and everything's fine, uh, we're all gonna be okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so a little bit of satisfactory. I, I'm working on finishing the phase three production stuff so I can move on to phase four, which means all of my factory systems are getting extra complicated and I'm getting into building things that need four components and that's all good and, and fun. And I've been enjoying that. Really, though, I spent more time playing UFO 50, probably, than than that, and uh, I got the cherry in Barbuda, which mm. uh, requires you to finish the game with all of your lives at the end of it. Ah. Yeah. Did that. It's not as hard as it sounds. Really, all you have to do is collect enough money over the course of the game to recover any lives that you've lost at a cost of 100 Mm. gold each in the room before the boss fight and then beat the boss fight without taking a hit yeah which isn't particularly hard either so definitely doable um and i done done it so that was nice it's part of a larger urge that has been like growing in me to start digging around in the meta narrative and yeah. figuring out the you know who these people are and these characters and and if for no other reason finishing the games lets me see the credits in in yes. cases of of later ones and so then I can start making those connections and and doing all of that so that's kind of where I'm at with it I'm still I'm I'm really surprised and I'm sure it's this is probably more of a commentary or a thought on how fragmented uh, we have become on the internet again. And I, I do think that that is a good thing writ large. I, I think that the centralization of where we meet, you know, of our communities, the places we go to exchange information online into social media systems has been fucking disastrous and mm-hmm. so i'm i'm glad to see the internet is moving in a direction of decentralization 
Um, even though in a lot of cases that decentralization is still existing on large platforms, the system needs work is what I'm saying. But the, the other downside of it is I don't know where I can go to find people having conversations and trying to puzzle out this meta narrative. Mm. My first thought would be the, the, the Steam community page That would for have the game. been my first thought too. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's not happening there. No? Huh. Maybe, maybe there's a Discord somewhere that, that this is going on in. I, I don't know. Um, but I have not found... And, and part of that, too, is that Google sucks so bad now. But I have not found much conversation at all about mm. this sort of background stuff. And I, that bums me out because, yeah. like... There was effort put in here, and I, you know, when you do things like that, you never really know how the reaction's going to be or the response or if people are going to go and find that stuff at all, but I, I feel like you hope they do, otherwise you wouldn't have bothered. And yeah, you know, so that just, that bums me out, but I want, I want Derek and everybody involved in the project to know that I'm, I'm looking at it, and I'm trying to play in your world so thank you um yeah but it's it, i'm still very hooked into ufo 50 and, and enjoying it a lot and and there are still games that i open them up and i look at them and I think, god how am i ever going to finish this but none of them are so long that they feel insurmountable they're just yeah. some of the early ones feel very very tedious in that respect but it, it it can be done. I've done games like them before. I will do games like them again. So I'll probably get through it. Yeah, that's yeah. what I've been playing this week. Uh, you've been playing anything, anything else this week, Steph? Yes, I have. Um, so I've obviously been playing um, more Vampire Survivors Ode to Castlevania, uh, which, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think there's any biases there. No conflict of interest <laughs> on that one. It's huge. The content is massive. It's nowhere near unlocked all the stuff. Uh, I will say, um, I bring this up because it's not the one I've played extensively because there's something else to talk about. But I would just say, as at the time of talking, uh, there are a fair few bestiary entries that are not unlocking. And... I did follow up on that, so they are going to be here by the end of this week or early next week. So they are coming, um, and some of my best ones are not yet there. So well worth checking out, and thank you so much to the folks that have sent me nice um, compliments to what I wrote. really appreciate that, but I'm, I'm antsy just waiting for Legion's uh, entry to... Uh, manifest <laughs> the other game i've played is something called slitterhead mm, i've seen this popping up a bit yeah and that's that they're trying their little best i'll say that it's not quite the survival horror i expected from what people were saying about it it's it's equal parts action game investigation game and very rudimentary environmental puzzler. Bit of stealth thrown in as well. You're a spirit, a time-travelling spirit, because this game doesn't get contrived enough. You're a time-travelling spirit who can possess people, and you are in this city while monsters are running around called Slitterheads, and they pop out of people's heads. Their heads explode. And then a writhing mass of guts and squick comes out. And then, after some time, it grows and unfolds and unfurls to create some sort of horrific bug monster with the limp and lifeless body hanging off it like a tiny vestigial tail. And these things are like big tentacly things. with They've got trace amounts of animal in them so there's one that's octopus like it's got tentacles and a bright color scheme 
But other than that, it's it's just a mass of, of bug-like monstrosity. Uh, there's one that um, is like a praying mantis. And they, they're sort of beautiful in their own horrific way. And the idea is you hop from body to body to get an advantage over the monsters. So there are chase sequences where a freshly slitted slitter head uh, is running away from you after you find it. You're chasing it and what you can do is jump to bodies that are ahead of you to catch up or jump to a body if you can get one ahead of the slitter head and that lets you be in front of them so you can pop off a hit on them or something. In combat there are a bunch of almost always a bunch of NPCs cowering around you and you jump around to like outflank the monster and get behind it, stuff like that or jump into one yell at it and then when it turns round jump into another. There are a couple of main characters who, they're called rarities in the game and they keep their consciousness and have better fighting abilities whoever you jump into can manifest a kind of blood weapon and has some basic skills but the main ones can like one of them has big claws made of blood or a blood shotgun stuff like that so the idea is using them to deal most of your damage but making sure you are using enough innocent human beings basically as a meat shield so far the game has not Deigned to explore the uh, the implications of that. And it's so upfront, it shouldn't be an implication. But it doesn't really, or hasn't so far gone into the fact that you can, for example, jump off a building because it's too far down and then jump into another person when you get close enough to the ground, leaving the other one to die. It doesn't strike me as a moral position, this protagonist's um, point of view, but it does make for some interesting conceptual gameplay. There are other bits to it as well, like there's a bit they've taken from Forbidden Siren, uh, slash Siren, depending on um, where you are in the world, where they've got the sight jacking. I don't know if you've uh, if you're familiar with Siren, but you could see f- out of their eyes. You could see what the enemy was seeing. And you can do that here, but it's kind of... It's here more as a gimmick. It's not... Again, so far, I'm like a couple of hours in. It's not like in Siren where using the the eyes uh, helps you hide from stuff. The game says it'll help you look for where they are, but eh, you're better off just following the little ghostly trail that more or less points you to them. Although that is cool, you will see them disguised as a normal human hanging out with other people who they plan to kill and you walk up to them, spray them in your blood and then their heads explode and they run off while yelling like, why, why? Because they are, they keep human speech and act like they're the, the scared and hurting ones sometimes. Which again, maybe that'll lead somewhere. Maybe it won't because the writing leaves something to be desired, as does a lot of the gameplay. It feels very budget, like budget game TM. And it seems like if they maybe had more money in development, this could be something special. But as it stands, it's closer to the curiosity end of the innovation scale. Lots of great little ideas, but some stuff that they haven't, They've either not thought about or didn't have the resources to deal with. For example, you can body hop into someone who's just walking around in the street, break into somewhere with them, jump out of them, and they will just stand there. They won't react in any way. They don't even act groggy or something to kind of explain why they're not doing anything. They will just stand there. Um, And a lot of NPCs, unless someone dies or there's a slitter head around, won't react to weird stuff. The other thing they 
either didn't think about or didn't like have time to address is in order for some of this game to work like bouncers stopping you going in the main entrance or stealth sections there are some npcs you just can't jump into and it's not explained why and the only reason we can accept it is because we're in a video game and we need this puzzle to work and i don't like it when that happens even if you just throw in like put in a throwaway line about oh they professional bouncers can't be jumped into or something about will you know these games love talking about willpower um but it, it's part, part of becoming a bouncer is that you have to agree to wear tinfoil hats mm. it's part of the uniform that's the dress it. code that's it like when the military starts showing up at least they've got like funny little sci-fi helmets on and what uh, one of them one type of them starts showing up with a disruptor gun that's designed specifically for you because they want to deal with you as well as the slitter heads um so there's explanation there but not when it's just some schlub that you've got to avoid because the game has decided to do stealth now so you can't jump into that one um yeah i don't like it when games do that when it's just well, you can't do this thing you can easily do in-universe because it's a game. Other than that, it I don't dislike it because there is a scrappiness to it that I respect. And I do like the visual designs of the monsters. Like, we were talking about The Thing earlier. This is body horror, like the visuals of it. I do like body horror. Yeah. It's and it, it controls very wonky. It's not bad. It's just there's a certain slidiness to some games that you see it a lot in what we call Eurogenk games, where you can tell it was made on a budget. But the fact that they've tried to do what they're doing with that limitation is laudable and it's not a terrible game. So yeah. I don't know how, how how strongly I'd recommend it to anyone, but it's worth looking at. Like, if you want to look at some videos of it, at the very least, because there's some visually interesting stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyone else played anything else this week, or is that about it? I think that's about it. I think that's about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a couple of very quick and newsy bits for this week. Nothing like big that's going to need any any in depth discussion this week. Okay. But I, I do want to bring up my little pet conspiracy theory this week, based on a news story that happened. So, do you remember how Michelle Ancel left Ubisoft a few years ago to go run an animal sanctuary or something? Mm, yeah, I do recall when that. When he was, like, in the middle of making Beyond Good and Evil 2, his magnum opus he's been, like, begging Ubisoft to let him make for a decade... And out of nowhere, seemingly, he decided to not work at Ubisoft anymore. Right around the time that all the investigations into upper staff at Ubisoft were happening? It was a pretty startling uh, coincidence, but I'm sure that's all it is. I'm sure that's all it is. Well, we've got another data point that's definitely unrelated to that that's going on. Um, Now that we're several years detached from that moment of like investigations going on at Ubisoft... Michelle Ancel is coming back to Ubisoft. Oh. Yeah, he's 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 had his like two, three years of running a an animal sanctuary or whatever, and he's like, I'm done with that. I'd like to be back making video games again now. Now now that the heat's died down or whatever maybe I just got bored of animal farming three years in, but I want to come back to video games. I, I like this other bit in the uh in the piece that you you sent us where he he comments on how he he thinks ubisoft should green light the sequel to prince of persia lost crown because everybody's all <laughs> salty about that critically acclaimed games uh team getting you know shut down and and that's good pr <laughs> to express you know a little bit of uh sentimentality and and outreach to the gamers oh i love it Love it. Right, right. I wonder why he would be emotionally invested in that. Um, 
but yeah, he's come he's come back. He's apparently working on some like three D Rayman reboot or something. But for all I know, it's entirely innocent his departure and return timing. But it sh- like I'm not gonna make any allegations. But if a person was trying to dodge scrutiny during a company wide uh, investigation of people's culpability, a way you might do that is to leave the company right before investigations happen and then ask to have your job back a little while later when the heat's died down. That is a thing someone could do. Yeah, it sounds and, even like a know, very effective strategy to uh, dodge accountability. Yeah. It really feels like it could be. And, you know, uh, that's just... That observation is what it is, and we don't... You know, I'll leave it to other people whether they want to play dot dot to dot with that. I'll tell you what, um, I won't play... Ubisoft's games because it Whoa. was it was and by certain accounts is a den of dirty fucking blokes getting away with it. I mean, it sure sounds like maybe some actions have happened in this story that might have been a bloke trying to get a- around stuff. If 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 it's ever proven, I'm going to call in Michelle Incel so hard. Oh, you you real get them that way. Oh, I tell you what, right? Payback, friends. You come up with a funny name, that'll show him. Um, I mean, <laughs> it, it it has brought kings to their knees. I mean, his name was King Foreskin. So you didn't live that <laughs> one down. Sorry, that King took Foreskin me a the third. <laughs> <laughs> my I stopped and was like, wait, Michelle Ancel was called King Foreskin. <laughs> took me a second to realize what the joke there was. <laughs> ah. Um Beyond that, nothing that's like we actually need to dig into. Two just nice two just positive things to know. <laughs> Nintendo finally spoke up about the Switch 2. Is it a release date? Is it a when it's coming or a price or feature set? Not really. Uh, they had an investor briefing, and they acknowledged the successor console purely to say it will be backwards compatible. So on goes the wait for them to say anything actually tangible. But if you've got Switch games, you can you can keep playing them. Don't be worried to buy a Switch game in case you move to next gen. I feel like that was a smart move considering how many fucking units they have out there. Yeah, I think it would have pissed a hell of a lot of people off if they couldn't bring their library forward. It would have been, mm. well, I'll just stick with the one I've got that my, my games work on. The question about it remains, what does this mean for shit like the MIG Switch and for the devices that exist for ripping games to PC very easily and for putting them onto a cartridge that will run on unmodified hardware. Yeah, what you're asking is, is including this architecture going to open the door for them to do this shit all over again? Well, see, here's a thing that's really interesting. I talked to Steph about this I was not about on the to show say, recently. Right, I hope it continues, because one of my favourite things about every new Nintendo release now is two weeks before... <laughs> <laughs> when you show me you playing it, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I with the I, there's early a really copy in... that you get legally right. and distinctly. From hey, hey, I truck. I show off boxes of games yes. that I get from a dodgy mate that will sell me them early. But I also do keep an eye on what's going on in the the illicit space, just because I'm fascinated by it. Um, the, the the thing that like a couple of weeks ago was floating around is. Potentially some explanation as to why Nintendo went as hard as they did in recent months on um, emulators for the original Switch. Okay, so winding back, a few months ago there was a huge leak of data from the Pokemon company. And this has included shit like videos of unreleased Pokemon games and like uh, transcripts of meetings and like stuff that proves like, oh, this is legitimate, like beta builds of old Pokemon games. But one of the things that came out of this was some files talking about Switch 2 software. And the thing that's really interesting is they're using the same file structure, the same file extension, the same uh, way of compiling games for the Switch 2 as they are for the original Switch. Uh, They are making .xci or .nsp files for the Switch 2, which suggests emulators for the base version of the Switch probably wouldn't need that much tweaking by their creators 
to probably be able to run Switch 2 games. Like, it's the same file infrastructure, it is the same package format. It does seem like maybe the reason Nintendo went as hard as they did on emulators in the last, like, six months, and not any of the time before that, is they finally locked in, we're using the same file structure and these emulators might be able to play stuff for the ne- for our new console on day one. Which is interesting, mm. and I'm so curious to see what Nintendo... If Nintendo has gotten around the piracy issue for next gen, and if so, what their solution is. Because the more stuff is is surfacing, the more it sounds like the the ground could be there for this to drag on into into next gen. Welp. But yeah, welp indeed. And the last thing, and this is just a a, a feature that I'm 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 glad to see has been announced. Um, the online co op mode for the Binding of Isaac has finally got a date for it. Okay. Uh, it's coming out on November eighteenth, and I'm 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 looking forward to that. Oh, I might. F- I might get further in the last fucking expansion it did when it <laughs> got really hard. Well, if you want some company to to fight through the really hard bits with, I will. I will play some online Isaac oh, with you. That sounds yeah, like that a could blast. Be a yeah, I haven't played Isaac in God. I what? I wonder what Steam says the last time I played Isaac was twenty twenty two. Oh wow! Ooh. My cloud is out of sync. Well, that ca- that that update's coming out in a little less than two weeks. If you two just fancy hanging out and playing some Isaac yeah. multiplayer sometime, that seems kind of fun. Yeah, we should do that. We cause... should. I'm up for yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. I still haven't even bought Afterbirth, I don't think. It's it's good. It's hard. Yeah. It's just, it's, 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 the whole it's game's just hard. too much. There's just too much shit in the game. <laughs> that's, that's always it. been it my such attitude. A yeah. 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 Such a good game. Yeah, you you have to just at a point accept you're never going to see it all and just go, I'll, mm-hmm. I'll enjoy what I see. Yeah. But yeah, there we go. Bang on an hour. Look at that. Cracked it out. Good for us. Yep. Start, started less than a minute to video games, finished on the hour. Perfect efficient. work. Efficient. Um, speaking of efficient, Laura, you are a comprehensive and ruthless worker. Oh. That sounded accusatory. You're really good <laughs> at stuff. Can you tell Aww. people about it? Yeah, you can find me at Laura K. Buzz pretty much everywhere on the internet you're going to find people. Uh, Laura K. Buzz on Blue Sky, Laura K. Buzz on Patreon, that's the one that pays the bills. Uh, Laura K. Buzz on YouTube and Twitch. Uh, there's some stuff you can check out this week. Um, there's a piece up on gamesindustry.biz called How Accessible is Being a Gaming Content Creator uh, by Jeffrey Bunting. I contributed some stuff to that alongside a bunch of other disabled creators. Really happy with how that piece turned out. Uh, go check that out. Um, you might spot me occasionally on the Twitch front page uh, coming up in the future because a uh, cool thing that I-, I found out today is I'm now part of the Twitch Limitless Talent Collection, which is their name for they're, they're highlighting a bunch of disabled streamers, and there's a there's a page you can go to and see a bunch of cool disabled streamers doing stuff. But also, they might just they, they might just highlight me on the front page every now and then, and that's pretty cool. Um, I am playing through all the Veil Guard slowly on Twitch, so that's uh, look forward to that Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. There's probably other stuff I'm not thinking of, but uh, Conrad, what about you? Where are you at on the internet? Oh, you can find me at Conrad Zimmerman on Instagram and Blue Sky, and you can hang out with me on Twitch at twitch.tv slash thatconradzimmerman. I'm on Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays. I play Spelunky. My wife Linda's been playing through Silent Hill 2 Remake, uh, so come check that out. Uh, you can buy anti-capitalist propaganda and Jimquisition merchandise at mercenarycreative.com. And everything that I do online gets supported through Patreon at patreon.com slash fistshark. And you know who else has a Patreon? Stephanie Sterling. That is very correct. Patreon.com slash Jimquisition. Uh, that supports the podcast and the videos and the reviews on Jimquisition. The Jimquisition.com, rather. Um... What else have we got going on? Uh, I stream Twitch TV slash Jim Sterling and check out Ode to Castlevania. Um, I will let folks know when the final bestiary entries are in. Um, they're all written. They were all written and they're, I think it's some of my finest nonsense. Um, <laughs> I do have some wrestling stuff coming up, but um, 
I've got the dates penciled in, so I don't want to uh, give them away. But I will be um, back in December with Pinfall Pro Wrestling and Tidal. So, yeah, I'll let you know closer to the date. Other than that, it's time we F off. Thank you so much for listening. And we will see you next week because we ain't fucking going anywhere. Bye. Bye. Bye.